Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you nearly live from Georgetown, Ontario. We're at St. George's Anglican Church. Easter is just finished, so we thought it would be a good time to go and talk about the Bible and the way in which religion is taught, not to us normal people, but to people who are going to be then preaching to the rest of us. So sitting here with the canon, Reverend Rob Park, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. So full disclosure, I came to this church growing up. You, uh, you came, I think, when I was in 10th grade, 11th grade, when I was in high school. So I've known you for a long time. Uh, I've been in the church when you've preached. I really, I've always enjoyed your sermons, especially at Christmas. Kind of, they're always say. they're always really good, <laughs> and, and they always make me think, um, which is kind of the point, uh, I, I assume. But I, I've always wanted to talk to you about the way in which you were taught, and then some of the practicalities of that, because when people have died in my life, particularly when my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer, I read a lot of books about death, and a lot of them, of course, talk about religion and the way we deal with it. And there's so many different interpretations of it. And I'm always interested, as someone who is a historian, where I can read a historical document and come to a different interpretation than someone else who's read the same thing. This happens in religion, obviously, all the time, where people have read different that are the same text, come to wildly different conclusions about them. So I want to talk to you about the way in which you are taught first, and then we'll talk about the implementation of it. So when you were going through your studies uh, to, to become a reverend, what are you taught about the Bible, and how much interpretive material is there in your classes? What I was taught started probably in my undergraduate when I took religious studies. Um, I switched from uh, a science major to a religious studies major after my first year mm-hmm. um, and there's an, an interesting story there but we don't need to go into <laughs> that um, but the the way that we look at the bible is important first off like foundationally um, was to sort of recognize that it is a, a whole bunch of different books put together it's a it's kind of like a whole bookshelf of books written at different times that right. are collated together and yeah. so and that brings with it um, some interesting challenges because there isn't this sort of coherence. Um, there are multiple authors. There are different um, genres of stories and different ways of telling the story. Um, both um, that uh, and and so you know there's that's sort of one of those first pieces. And I guess if there's a um, one of the things that I've been kind of combating against uh, personally and 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 when I teach is to sort of push. Uh, people away from what I call um, kind of that Christmas card understanding of the Bible Mm -hmm. and particular the stories of Jesus because um, we have these amalgamations of all those different books that kind of get pushed together uh, and and to to try to treat them as separately. So that was uh, sort of one of the foundational Mm -hmm. pieces, I think, um, from my first um, studies in the academic setting to right. looking at the Bible was to be able to sort of break it down into its into its pieces, mm-hmm. um, and so to begin to understand uh, the different components mm-hmm. first before you sort of jump in. Now that um, and that's a that's probably the the foundational right. piece, right? Which is really it, it's interesting because uh, some of my friends who aren't religious they say to me like. So do you really believe then that a snake talked to a woman in a garden? And I, I say, no, I don't. I'm, I think it's a metaphor, right? Like it's, it seems like there's, there's people who think literal interpretation. It's interesting, too, that you mentioned the different books, too, because that's another pushback that I, some people have is that these were written hundreds of years after the events about which they're writing, and they're being written by people. Like, so there's a, this human element to it. But it all, oftentimes it gets presented as a singular entity, exactly. right? Just in the in the public mind, it's like the Bible. That's right. Um, yeah. But to consider it different, that's I guess allows for a greater, maybe what, what greater interpretation or a greater well, greater understanding of the context. Well, and it, yes, exactly. And I think that's the most one of the most important pieces is context. And that um, certainly in my seminary training when we actually did biblical studies, um, an important part of that was breaking uh, the books and the passages and the um, even individual words um, write down and trying to understand their context. So um, even the choice of words that we're using in particular in the New Testament, each gospel 
uh, writer has their own style, um, has phrases and words that they use that are um, sometimes particular to them or that are used more by them in particular and so they they kind of meet the their 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 theme for the gospel and um, even just looking at the uh, and then trying to even take that back to the uh, original language in which the right. it was written in because mm-hmm. of course English isn't the Bible was not written in English right um, and so to look at uh, the Greek um, that a lot of the New Testament texts were written in, but then also to understand that the words probably spoken by Jesus were Aramaic. Mm. And so again, there's already a translation of a translation <laughs> right, of a translation. Yeah. And, you know, growing up in Canada and knowing uh, uh, a little bit of French and English together, you understand that there's sometimes there are phrases and thoughts and expressions that don't quite yeah, they don't translate yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so you're guesstimating. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, certainly as educated as possible, they make educated guesses on what would be the appropriate English word. Mm -hmm. But, again, with Bibles, you have multiple translations of the Bible in which groups of people who translate them into English, they get to choose the words they use Mm -hmm. in English to, to, to represent or to be translated for the the original text. Mm. So when you're going through then and you're, you're learning about all this, is it the way, I almost imagine the way I run a seminar, where I give the, the, the class a reading and then we sit around and talk about it. And what does it mean? What's significant about it? And what can we take from it? Is it like that? Or is it, or are they trying to give you interpret, an interpretation that they want you then to take out? Uh, like, I'm just wondering how much your personal sure. understanding, so, your experience, your background would, of course, influence your interpretation of the text. Right. So I think that uh, certainly from my seminary professors, so uh, my undergraduate um, I did in religious studies, mm-hmm. so just a general BA, um, but then from there to seminary. And uh, my seminary professors certainly approached um, biblical studies uh, a lot more intensive and a lot more in a, a very academic way. Mm-hmm. And so it, I wouldn't necessarily say there was as much interpretation as there was dissection and giving us the, the tools uh, to equip us to be able to look at a text, to try to um, discern uh, from our reading and from our research what the context of the reading is, what was the uh, intention of the, of the writer of that passage, compare it inside its the greater work. So if you're looking at a particular gospel, it's to say how did what is the point of this particular gospel? But like I said, even to break it down from words to phrases, to look at the cultural kind of references, because you know obviously the references that are made are ones that were based on the situation and the right. context that the that the um, the teacher. Uh, in this case, Jesus was living in, mm-hmm. right? So uh, agricultural, you dealt with uh, an oppressive Roman authority that was in control mm-hmm. over a land that once was theirs. Um, you have um, it, some some problems and some situations are similar. Growing up uh, in, or sort of doing my, uh, f- my first parish on my own was in St. Catharines. And when we went looking for a home, there were a lot of uh, places for rent, but a lot of them were for students. And a lot of the landlords lived out of town. A lot of the numbers we had to call to were Toronto numbers. Right. In Jesus' time, there were lots of um, uh, landowners um, that were um, out of the country. And so right. there's m- multiple stories about landowners, uh, you know, speaking to their tenants and, mm-hmm. you know, those sorts of agreements. And so those would have been the context that J- Jesus, the people that Jesus was speaking to would have understood and that the early church would have Right. understood because of their situation, right? The mm-hmm. context. Sure. And so again, understanding the context helps you to understand what's the point of this story. Right. Um, even understanding the Christian church grew from its Jewish roots. A lot of the teachings that Jesus teaches and a lot of the context comes from uh, having a Jewish background. And, right. And the people sure. he, that he's speaking to having a Jewish context. And so again, mm-hmm. context is really important. Right. So it's almost like a history class, basically. I mean, that's and what that's, it sounds like. And that's exactly what um, I think our, our uh, professors at seminary um, taught the course. Like, yeah, there was, you know, certainly uh, the faith component to mm-hmm. it. Um, but I would say that for me, and, 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 and coming out of seminary, I was, the kind of, the, the joke was at, at the seminary that I went to is that they, they basically um, took you apart <laughs> and left you to put yourself back <laughs> together again. And, and, and for a priest, you want to make sure 
that their faith and their uh, understanding of their faith in the scripture um, isn't so fragile that if one piece gets broken, the whole thing crumbles down. Right. Because in parish ministry, um, where you're going to be in situations, or even in everybody's life, you're going to be touched with situations of grief. And mm-hmm. you know, mentioned you mentioned uh, you know funerals, sure, and yeah. things like that, where it makes you question, it makes you wonder, and mm-hmm. you you begin to read and inquire, and and if you start to come to conclusions that don't match up with a rigid faith, then things fall apart and that's right. not a good thing to have uh, as a parish priest well so let's talk about that then because you've been here now for 16 what, years 16 years yeah as so, of easter day oh so there I you go first yeah. that was my 16th anniversary <laughs> nice nice so uh, well congratulations uh 16 years that's pretty good that is. that's a good run um you come into a situation and everyone has different ways that they approach it certainly i i feel as though you know, I grew up with Tom Kingston, the previous reverend here. Obviously, his approach and I think your approach are different, uh, certainly stylistically mm-hmm. rather different. Uh, but everyone who comes through the door and goes and sits in the church is going to have a different uh, approach or a different relationship with religion than everyone else in the room and certainly with you. And your job, though, is to, on Sundays and other days, to preach and then in other situations to go to hospitals um, when people are sick or to, to marry people and uh, also to, to do baptism, right? This, the whole spectrum of sometimes people are happy, sometimes people are sad. And within that, everyone has a different belief structure that they're coming at it with. So recognizing that, how do then you approach the job, given the background of all these texts are different. Here's the historical context of it. How do you how do you help people then situate themselves within this very wide ranging structure? That's where the the richness and the diversity of the texts that are available mm-hmm. pay off because right. you can find uh, there's a story for everything. Uh, there's a story for everything. <laughs> um, I often will point. I, I I would often talk to people about, for instance, the the Book of Psalms. Okay, so from the Old Testament. Traditionally, in the history of the church, sometimes it was referred to as Jesus' prayer book. Mm. Um, and it's, there's a lot of poetry. There's a lot of prayer in it. And it is, it's rich. It's, there's you know, how great God is, and then there's also um, how alone and separate that people feel mm. from God. And uh, so I will often, especially when folks are, um, I look to the Psalms. Okay. Um, as both for encouragement, mm-hmm. but also for recognition that life is full of, you know, the happy moments and the sad moments. Mm-hmm. There are uh, there were there were, there are some psalms where you know uh, uh, everything I'm in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, everything takes like ash in my mouth. You know, the dogs <laughs> are licking my sores. <laughs> it's like you know everything's terrible. Where is God? You're not here. Um, and uh, we used to, I. In seminary, I used to joke about them because they seemed to come up every Friday when we were doing our <laughs> worship. And I thought, you know, Friday, it's Friday, it's the weekend. You yeah. know, we'd get these things, I call them <laughs> death dirges, right? And so you'd go, what? Why would these be even in here, mm-hmm. right? And if, if you imagine that these were all kind of separate poems and, and songs that were written down, and that there was a priestly class in the, you know, the high, uh, the good times uh, in uh, Jerusalem when David was king. Um, and that they decided to bring these together and start to put them into book form, that why they would leave those ones in. Right. Like, why would you leave the ones where it seems like, you know, God has abandoned me, and, Mm -hmm. you know, or these terrible things are happening to me and I don't understand. Right. Um, And and I guess it was when I was doing my clinical pastoral units in the hospital, when I was sort of there with the sick and the suffering, when I realized that, you know, this priestly class was actually pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Because they recognize that life is that too. Sure. And so it wasn't just about sugar coating or you know everything is good, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know God is great, and uh, you know uh, you're, it'll only be blessing in your life, kind of like the prosperity gospel stuff that right. you hear a lot of today. But yeah. recognizing that life is both joys and sorrows, and the Psalms being particularly uh, personal, almost like a prayer, um, and and poetry. Um, allows to express even that loneliness and isolation that happens. Mm. And so for me, in visiting folks in those kinds of different situations, um, in particular for those that are grieving or uh, 
facing uncertainty or sadness, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, for me, even just a comfort to say, like, I, that's, this is what you feel, and that's fine. Like, this fits, too. Like, mm. you're not alone in feeling that. Right. So the, it's a very, like, holistic, like, W, Absolutely. holistic yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, And that there, it, it accounts for everything. It accounts everything. for everything. And then, and then and part of the work of the church, like, um, the Anglican Church, uh, of which I'm part of, uh, one of our uh, strong traditions has been the idea of the seasons of the church, right? So you take us through the liturgical year and across the year, um, uh, beginning from Advent through Christmas and Epiphany um, and all the way through, um, mm -hmm. we've just celebrated Easter, is that if you think about it, through the course of a single year, we pass through using Jesus's life and the New Testament as our sort of our guide, um, through all the kind of important events of life. And so mm -hmm. each year we talk about birth and yeah. new beginnings. Each year we talk about suffering of innocence, injustice. Uh, we talk about death and sorrow. And so through the, through the course of the whole year, every person as we w attend church and as we walk through the seasons, we learn even when it's not happening in our life, mm -hmm. we learn the language, right? And right. the kind of the faith's response to it. And here's what the Bible says about this. And so that when it does happen in our life, um, we we are a little bit more equipped. We actually maybe right. have some vocabulary to use to help describe it or uh, ways in which to, to, to wrestle with it in our mm -hmm. own life or in our prayer life with God. Um, and I think that's a, you know, that's one of the richness of the of our tradition that allows mm. us to address that and and to point us to the appropriate scripture pieces right to look at right that's interesting because i mean think of, if you think of like a rom-coms or like sitcoms everything works out and everything's great at the end all the time right but well he does get resurrected at the he end. does yes that is true <laughs> it's right. pretty hard to top that one for yeah, a happy that, ending that is yeah that's a good point <laughs> yeah yeah walking on water water yeah, into wine yeah, he wins over evil and it's yeah, one it's forever that's you know true. so it's that, pretty good that is the ultimate yeah. happy I, I, ending. i have a lot of confidence in, in talking about that so like as as we look at it too and then certainly as as a historian and, and some of the stuff that i've worked on personally um a good example being residential schools and we don't have to talk about the specifics of certainly the anglican church's uh, role and then response to, to everything that happened but with things like residential schools and larger colonial issues around the world the the bible was used almost as a weapon in, in these times yeah, it was and that's another thing that I, I often wonder about and as as more and more people are, are maybe questioning religion and church and Absolutely. attendance goes down yeah. i wonder how much the awareness of these things when the bible was used in a, a, a very aggressive negative way how much that affects people's uh, approach to not only the church but religion in general and, and that's another one that i look at and i say the words that these people were reading were the same that that you read and that I've read and yeah. and they no, come absolutely. to these these interpretations that just make no sense to me and it, right. and in a lot of cases are pretty much inhuman and run counter to a lot of the stuff that I've been taught about the messaging so how do we as well how do you certainly as someone sure. who, who preaches this yeah. come to terms say if, if someone comes to you and, and makes reference to it or if a survivor of if not a residential school or another situation where the Bible was used in a negative way, like what, what's your answer to those questions sure. of, of negativity when it comes to religion? So uh, uh, first off, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, uh, agree with how you've characterized how the Bible has been used and how faith in general has been used. And, you know, I think um, you, we, you know, you can't deny that. And right. as a parish priest, I would never attempt to sort of, you know, say that none of that it wasn't used that way in fact absolutely i mean uh, one of my uh, favorite texts from my undergraduate was uh, the chapter from uh, dostoevsky's uh, the brother karasimov where the called the grand inquisitor uh -huh. in which a silent jesus is arrested by the the head of the S spanish inquisition and uh, okay. the the basically the inquisitor says um, jesus has come back uh -huh. returned and the grand inquisitor is trying to explain to jesus why he really doesn't need to be here how the church has got everything under control <laughs> um how they they're best for the people they know right. better than him and all that sort of stuff and it's it is a it's a wonderful illustration of of how 
uh, religion as uh, and the authority and power that came with that mm -hmm. in the structure as it built up, um, how it it got completely off the off the rails, sure. right? Yeah. And can be used for the wrong reasons right. and, and go and basically in this you know Jesus never speaks in the in the chapter, um, but as you listen to the inquisitor who, as the inquisitor speaks, you know completely incriminates himself and the whole the role the church has and how how far it's gotten from what Jesus would have taught. Right. I think Jesus kisses him in the end. Mm. And that's a you know and that's right. Jesus' response, right? And 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 for me that was a powerful um, yeah. piece to both depicting how um, the uh, uh, the church has abused the authority that the scripture gives mm -hmm. uh, and that the faith gives um, and used it as um, a way to manipulate the people right right so yeah. that's for me that's part of the history of right. our church and here we are I guess for me how part of how I reconcile that is to say that um, the fact is that you can sit and read and know mm -hmm. what for you what the teachings of the Bible understand what they are for you um, I know what the teachings of the Bible are for me and I can see what has happened in history mm -hmm. uh, and in particular of how the church has conducted itself and say that's wrong. That doesn't fit right. with what I was, what I'm taught, sure. or what yeah. I understand, or how I interpret yep. the scriptures, right? And there's, um, for me, there's a lot of components in that. And 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 for me personally, as a priest, like how do I handle this? Yeah. Is to say, okay, so when I look at our uh, our church and our the institution and mm -hmm. the structure, there's a lot of pieces that we've baked on. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, at a time when we wanted to say um, I, the joke in church here, I always say, you know, once we do something once, it becomes a tradition. You know? <laughs> right. So yeah. we have a dinner, yeah. we do this, and then yeah. all of a sudden now it's the yearly <laughs> tradition. We have to do it every year. And I think it's very easy for us as a, a, a people that if something is effective and it works and it helps communicate something, then it becomes a pattern and it becomes so much a part of who you right. are. It, it get it gets baked on. Yeah. And then you you don't think about it, right? And it doesn't get questioned. And I think the church has come to a point where through its uh, through uh, the power that it received when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. through its uh, the survival of the church through the Dark Ages, through the monasteries and yeah. all that sort of stuff, like there was a, a structure that uh, allowed it to be the right kind of thing at the right time. But then once it passes its its usefulness right we can't we have a hard time dispensing it right right yeah um i think the way that we you framed this conversation um points us points me in the right direction and that's i'm pleased to talk about it because it's the it's 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 looking back at the original text right and right. as you said two people can sit down and read a text a historical document and come up with two different interpretations mm -hmm. and i think uh, there are times when the church has made an interpretation of what they believe the message of the scripture was um, that was may have been appropriate in some way shape or form mm -hmm. may not have been may have been but that um, we can now go back and discern sure and we can discern because we yeah. can go back to the original text so there's two words one is discernment yeah and that's important uh, for interpretation in, in terms of doing that then what what i find interesting of course is sort of the, the current context right and yeah. the way in which the uh, our understanding of those original texts can be influenced by current events and, right. and larger shifts in society whether they be on on race ethnicity gender yeah. um, sexuality all these things have sure. shifted culturally and it seems some people in various churches have gone with it and others have not and again that's interpretive and that's sure. that's fine that's that's the way it is but w what's super interesting to me too is is like i've taught world history before mm -hmm. and teaching you know the reformation and I, this is when i was in china so most of my students didn't have really any background in christian theology at all right uh, or symbolism so I, I i tried to do it in the the, the most straightforward way i could and I, I basically on the board i put here's god and here's how the Catholic Church says you get to God. Here's how some of the Protestant churches say you get to God. And then they had wars over this. Yeah. And a lot of them said, why would, why would you fight over this? Yeah. Like, it seems like the, the differences seem so minor. Yeah. 
Uh, and to me, I, I say, yes, they do seem minor, but sure. here's why they had wars. And a lot of it has to do with power and authority and all these yeah. larger issues that have nothing to do with the actual text yeah. itself. And I think that's too, like when you talk about being discerning, yeah. uh, as, as, for lack of a better word, consumers of this stuff, uh, we, we have to discern where it's coming from and the reason why that message could be coming from that place. And certainly, I think, not to get political, but evangelicals in the United States, some of the stuff that, that, that they talk about a lot may be seen as antithetical to some of the teachings, but we have to understand the context in which they're, they're doing that. And, and the same thing happens. You know, e even the way the current pope differs from the last pope in the, their approach, their Absolutely, everything yeah. is so different. Yeah. And it, I, to be discerning about that, the way we're discerning about if I pick up a, a history book or if I pick up or if I read the news, right, yeah. I'm going to be discerning. Like reading a, a, a or listening to Rex Murphy do a commentary, you, you have to be discerning about that. Absolutely. You don't just sort of take it for granted. And yeah. I think that the same has to be true for religious texts. Power, influence, mm -hmm. those are yeah. part of the, oh, so my other piece yeah. was human brokenness. Mm. All yeah. right? So that's, and that's for me is where the piece where as a church you know, it's full of human beings. Yes. And so there is human brokenness. And part of those, that, uh, the power dynamics, um, whether it's for uh, riches, um, prestige, influence, I mean, those are the, those are the pieces that there is, uh, there's a, um, a quote from the book of Ecclesiastes that it goes, there is nothing new under the sun. Oh. And as a historian, you yeah. know that, yeah. how the things cycle. And there yeah. really is nothing new. And, no. and how... Um, you know, the faces change and the names change and even sometimes the places change, but that kind of the dynamic that, yeah. and that it repeats. Yeah. And so there's a rinse and repeat mm -hmm. that happens. Yeah. And so the church at one point had influence and power, um, and it was because of the, on the back of the church and the beliefs that the church set up that allowed for the community to spread and for there be social order right. and all those sorts of things are our current laws are a lot based on biblical laws sure, yeah. and our our understanding of, of 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 our relationship as human beings to God um, mm -hmm. and the idea and the concepts of you know the golden rule that sort of mm -hmm. stuff like those are all pieces that become a part of how we govern and maintain ourselves and the church had a big role in that yeah and well the calendar even right it's a christian calendar absolutely yeah, yeah. so and a, but that's that sort of authority and power for human beings ultimately will corrupt some right and so you get folks that and then you know you get the kind of situations that you we look at today and you say here's where people either disguise their intentions right. um, and then have people who um, are fooled into following mm -hmm. and uh, it takes the discernment of you and I as people uh, yep. to look at it and say, hmm, does this really fit? And that's hard to do sometimes. And, yeah. you know, as we um, wrestle and question, you know, why the evangelical church supports someone like Donald Trump with the lifestyle that he's leads and the, you know, the questionable things that he, he's been alleged to do, mm -hmm. um, then you go, well, how does that fit? And yet right. there's some sort of mental gymnastics that happen right. in people that that does that. And that's that's nothing new under the sun. Sure. Yeah, right? it happens all the time. It happens, it happens all, all the time. time. That's history, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and I think, so that's the, so that's the, those are the two pieces for me that are important in looking at both the history of the church mm -hmm. and how we use the Bible is to recognize the human brokenness in, yeah. in things. I mean, Jesus is, um, is a very rebellious figure. Sure, yeah. And so he is yeah. not only pushing against the Roman occupant, occupying uh, forces. He's also pushing, which the people all want. They want them out. Um, he also is pushing back about, against corruption that he sees in the, the way that uh, temple Judaism was mm -hmm. conducted in the centralness of the temple. And, you know, Jesus was part of what he was teaching was that, you know, God can be anywhere. God right. can be on the street. You can be healed and forgiven on the road. In, uh, you can be a Samaritan and I can offer you forgiveness, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't need to go to the temple and sacrifice these specific animals that have been raised in a specific way. Right. You don't have to repeat, you know, specific prayers to be forgiven. And so, and that was part of his rebelliousness. That's what right. got him killed. Sure. That's what 
you know, upset yeah. the authorities enough that they plotted to kill him. And that, and that, for me, those are the, you know, those are the pieces when you look at, if you look at the New Testament, and we've got four different Gospels, four different tellings of Jesus' story, that's, you know, that's one of the common things through it, that right. they, he upset the authorities and they wanted to kill him, and so they did. They had right. him crucified. Um, and so there's the, you know, there's the usage of, of power. Right. And, and then the uh, irony, of course, that then the, the church is, or churches have then sort of go on to replicate, in some cases, that power structure. Absolutely. And, and, and I don't want to give the impression, I think, that churches are bad, but yeah. churches have done bad things. Absolutely. In the past. Yeah. And, and, and I think that always leads to, like, how can people who, who claim to be yeah. preaching uh, this message right. do these things? So the hopefulness that I carry yeah. in my heart is that even when I screw up, yeah. Even through the church's screw ups, and you know, terrible, you know, uh, wrong headed, in the wrong direction. Residential schools are yep. a perfect example. The Crusades are another example. Like we could name the sins of the church mm -hmm. that they've done, where they were, they, you know, for whatever um, reasons that they backed up biblically or scripturally, that things heinous and terrible things have been done. Is that through all that? The fact that we have the gospel message mm -hmm. that you and I can talk about and say, ah, Jesus doesn't teach that, um, that that will always be transmitted. Right. So that, you know, even if the Anglican Church of, uh, in the world fails, if the Roman Catholic Church in the world fails, that, that the message of the scripture of Jesus Christ will still be proclaimed somewhere in some form. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the scriptures, the texts will survive, and folks who have discernment, um, who are looking and willing to do the interpretation, will be able to pull the, the basic and core message that is mm -hmm. underneath it from it. Right. There are two ways, and this is, this is when I left seminary, that I was kind of left holding in, in two separate hands um, to try to balance. There is a way of approaching the scripture that is sort of academic, um, clinical mm -hmm. um, that dissects it uh, is willing to sort of look at its incongruencies um, and uh, and to, to live with them and then there is the way of approaching the text as a, a, a article of faith in a way in which a message um, is proclaimed and there's these two pieces and I, I just we did a Lenten study here um, through the season of Lent and that was one of the pieces that we talked about is sort of how do you um, how do you balance that? Because I had mm -hmm. some participants that were here. This is me trying to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. There's some participants that are willing to uh, wrestle with some of those incongruities. In fact, find some yeah. satisfaction in knowing that uh, I can wrestle with this and I can look at this a little more um, carefully and use some of the skills um, that I have as a human being to use my brain and to think things through. And then there are times when we need to approach the scripture text as a faith document. Hmm. that speaks to our heart. I kind of like um, a mantra or a prayer. Um, for me, uh, the scriptures uh, and the New Testament uh, has been a way in which I open my heart to hear that deeper message. And there may be times in a passage, I, I think about the story from Luke of the prodigal son. Um, it's a great story. It's only found in Luke's gospel. Um, and so being such a great teaching, you'd think it would be in all the other ones. But for some reason, it's not. It's only in Luke. And, you know, again, you can kind of, why is that so? And sure. what is it about Luke's story? You know, he, he's the only one that had, a, he had exclusive content, you know. So <laughs> he had to deal with uh, whoever it was that, you know, He's going to get so many more clicks That's right, than exactly. everyone else. Everyone's going to read his version of the gospel because it has this awesome story about, you know, an older son and a younger son. And, yeah. and but... Uh, so you can look at it from that academic perspective, or you can look at it from the, the spiritual um, sort of perspective and to say that, you know, there's a message in, in this, in the, in the archetypes that are presented. So there are times in our life when we feel like the younger, mm. and there are times when we feel like the older brother. Right. You know, I've done everything right, and yet, you know, this person, this loser who, you know, did everything wrong still gets all the benefits, right. you know? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's got a horseshoe up their butt, and yeah. look at that, and everything falls into place for them. Um, and then there's also the, um, the the father in the story who, you know, um, who uh, has two very different uh, children, and yet their love for them is 
equal in a way that it's hard for uh, a child to understand right. until they're a parent. And then to equate that kind of unconditional love, it's easy then to make the connection that that's how God loves us. Right. Right. And, yeah. And so there's there's multiple layers mm-hmm. to it. Um, and none of it is coming at that story from that kind of historical, what word did he use here? And what was the original <laughs> yeah. Greek? And, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and the context of a, a, a parent with two children is something that still fits with today. Yeah. So, you know, there's, so there's not a lot. The context isn't questionable. Sure. Right? So how did this situation get set up? We don't mm-hmm. understand, um, you know, what that is. So we still can get it today. And so there are, there's, as I said, there's these sort of two ways to approach the scripture. Um, Luke's gospel also has a story of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy um, who uh, his parents go to Jerusalem uh, to observe a religious festival and on their way back somehow they leave Jesus behind or Jesus gets left behind and he goes into the temple and his parents who've already gone a day and a half have Uh to take a day and a half to get back. So it's like it's like home alone Bible version. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Home alone Bible version. <laughs> and uh, so they go and they find him in the in the temple and he's teaching and everybody's astounded. Well, you know, we know. Um, uh, so and that's another story that's only found in Luke's gospel. Right. And you go, well, now why would that be included? Um, and so there is that um, he's it's a prodigal story, right? Mm hmm. A prodigy. He's a pro- sure. child prodigy. Yeah. Like he look how bright he is. He's teaching the the teachers in the temple, and they're astounded at his knowledge. Well, the beginning of Luke's gospel um, starts out with the author of the gospel addressing basically who the person who's the patron of him writing the gospel, uh, whose name is Theophilus. It's a very Greek name, um, and we were taught in seminary that you know part of a any Greek, and, and we believe that. Luke's gospel was written to a Greek audience. You know, this Theophilus person, obviously, but whoever else was going to be reading it, it was Theophilus that was being addressed, and that's, again, Greek. Well, and it would be commonplace in a Greek biography of the day that when you were talking about a great person, a Caesar or whatever, yeah. a great leader, you would always tell a story about when they were a child, how it was obvious, right. how great they were. Right. And so for Luke to include the, to be the only gospel that includes this story of a, the adolescent Jesus, mm-hmm. it's sort of like, okay, so that makes us understand the context of Luke's sure. gospel, yeah. um, uh, but, and, and puts it in maybe in its historical yeah. place. Yeah. W- is that story true or not? If it was that good a story, again, it's kind of like the prodigal son. Why didn't the other ones have included? Right, yeah, right? yeah. It'd be all over the place. Yeah, you'd think yeah. so. You know, that's yeah. a good one, another. Right. But that was maybe one another one of Luke's exclusives. Right, the but place. then if you take that as like a faith story, too, you could say, you know, it, kids can, like, the kids place it within this setting, right, that they can understand and appreciate uh, that or... Is, is my initial sure? An, well, as initial thought you could take from it is that re, that the religion or the the whatever the, the relationship with God is open to everybody, and yeah. it's not exclusive to grown ups right. or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and and for me looking at it uh, from sort of the academic context, contextual side is to say this is the author of the gospel just trying to say like, I know you're just starting to read this. We're only in you know <laughs> early chapters here, right? Um, but. Like, this guy is destined for great things. If you haven't right. figured this out, <laughs> they haven't heard the end yet, right? Because this, imagine right, it, yeah. the first person reading it, right? Yeah. They don't know how the story ends, right? right. And, and that's the piece that, for me, is always a big challenge and part of that challenge of the Christmas card Jesus, right? Sure. That has the, the nativity scene with the shepherds and the angel and the magi and the little drummer boy, mm-hmm. right? And, and we just... That's what the Christmas card was, right? Yeah. As a kid, when I remember looking at it, you know, the little drummer boy always had to be there. He's not biblical. Like we have the, you know, the little animated yeah. movie of it. And so all of a sudden, but it fits, right? Because he yeah. plays his drum for him. And, yeah. You know, that's what he can give. Just like the wise men giving what they can give. Right. And, and like, so there's a, a spiritual side to how that fits, but it isn't. It's it historical. Yeah. It's not accurate. Right. It's not, you know, so... It's been baked on. It's baked on. That's right. And so yeah. for me, it's been important to sort of try to cut away some of that baked on stuff. Right. And get and and get more to the... What does what does this scripture passage say? What does this... What was the intention of this author? And, and that's part of the work for me that my seminary trained me to do. 
that can be boring if you preach that on <laughs> Sunday. And so you, you kind of have to do that legwork first sure. and then say, okay, if this is what this passage is about, mm-hmm. so let's take the Jesus in the temple at 12, Yeah. right? So this passage is basically trying to say to the people that even from a young age, like Jesus was destined for great things and he was, his knowledge of his scripture and his understanding of the relationship between people and God was so great that even as a child, he could teach right. about it. Right. And and that's and for me, that's really the that would be the the point of my sermon on that. Now you mm-hmm. might want to find a story or something in today's headlines to help people connect and get their mm-hmm. head around it. You know, we have um, uh, for the longest time we had an organist here who was you know super talented, uh, a genius when it came to uh, playing the piano. And uh, I've seen pictures of him from the local newspaper where he grew up of him, you know, giving a, a piano uh, recital right. concert, right? He was talented as a yeah. young kid, and he's, here he is today, you know, yep. uh, and he's talented today. Like, the, we knew from a young age he was going to be talented. So there are some of those things where you can make those, and people go, oh, I get it. Yeah. Oh, so that's what they're saying about, right. you know, Jesus. He's going to be... He's the leader we're looking for. He's the Messiah. He is mm-hmm. God's, you know, son, chosen. Right. <laughs> and that's the that yeah. was the point of the passage. That, yeah. It's not about even saying something historically happened. Right. It's not, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's true or not, yeah. really. It's about... It is true. True. In the spiritual sense. Yeah. But it's academic stuff we can't... Right. We, we don't you know. You can't. And, and the fact that it's not... This, that story isn't in any of the other Gospels. It's hard to... So then it's even harder to bear. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. so, so I guess my, my last question, because I'm running out of time with you, because you have to go with the children soon, mm-hmm. um, who are coming in. Uh, we t- we talked about this briefly, and this is a gigantic question. But with the text then that you have and the meaning you can take out of it, and it, a lot of times, even on good things, people would ask why. Right? It's sort of the existential human question: yeah. why? Why are we here? Essentially, but also, yeah. why did this happen? Whether it's good like a birth death sad like whatever it is like why did this happen Uh, and i'm sure i'm sure you get that question all the time um would you have like a standard response that you use or do you go situation by situation and see this is it you have to be careful right because you know part of the answer is you know um uh, it's a mystery (laughs) right and that's so that one's that one's great that's a good answer right satisfies nobody okay um, but then there's also, um, and, and, and I guess if there's a pat answer, you, and you have to be very careful because in, in pastoral situations, you can't say, you know, something good will come of this. Right. Because if you say that to me and I've lost my child, then I'm going to punch you in the nose. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and rightly so. Yeah. And so for me, that would never be a response that I have. Right. And so dealing with those situations in a, in a pastoral sense, you, you, that's not where you go. You, uh, that's where I point to the Psalms, right? Like right. I talked about earlier. Yeah. Say, look, th- these are, that's that's part of our our faith. This is part of the the dark night of the soul. That you know, we there are times when we feel uh, cut off and abandoned from God. This is not, um, you know, Jesus in the garden, mm-hmm. you know, um, who you know prays that the cup be passed from his lips. Like like, there are times in our life when 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 we're facing things that we're not sure we can handle mm-hmm. or and we feel out of our depth right okay um and so i and in those sorts of situations that's what you acknowledge right but for me there's um and and as i said about the you know the birth and death of the church and in the anglican church like there's a big picture here that we cannot see and if, sure. if there's if there's something that brings me comfort of that i point to is that there is a a bigger mm-hmm. um, a bigger picture that right. that we don't know and that's and that's you know I part of my coming here um, was finding out and recognizing and realizing that I actually had a family history here mm. that my great-grandmother was baptized here and lived oh. here till she was about 10 and then her family moved her to the Hamilton area where right. I'm from yeah well in fact it goes back to my fourth great-grandfather Evan Price who was the first person buried in the cemetery right. back here, right? And yeah. I had no idea of the connection. I had some information my grandmother had given me. Uh-huh. Um, but 
um, that certainly piqued my interest in the history in the early sure. days of this church, yeah. right? And when you go through the the record book and you see the the losses and the suffering and the people died and the ages at which they died and you find out a little bit about their life and story, none of us have an idea um, what what will happen afterwards. Right. Whether it's who will be born, you know, four generations after us. Sure. If we have kids yep. and they have kids, and you know, mm-hmm. and and the impact, like the fact that I would be back here as the parish priest, yeah. is kind of amazing. Yeah, to think yeah, that yeah, yeah. the baptismal font where my great grandmother was baptized, that I'm here doing baptisms yeah. of children and teaching the faith about, but also to recognize the, um, and and this I see from my ministry uh, in doing funerals, is the is the impact and the ripple effect that every life has. Right. And how no matter how long a life you've lived or how short a life you've lived there's impact and again this is not and i don't say that if you were grieving i wouldn't say this to comfort you no right no. because again i because you, you would have every right to punch me in the nose right. if i said that but yeah looking at it from the from the bigger perspective right, step even back. in my, in my yeah. family to say in the history of it all yeah you know my fourth great grandmother evan's wife sarah was a midwife so okay. how many babies did she yeah. help safely bring into the world? Right. People that wouldn't have existed, whose offspring wouldn't have existed, if she hadn't been there doing something that she probably thought, well, I know how to do this. I've helped with a lot of births. It's not a big deal. Right. You know, here's what we need. Here's the situation. Oh, this is what we do. The baby saved. Right. Or in the times when the baby was lost. Yeah. Like, it, that's just, yeah. you it's, know, times of great grief, mm-hmm. but also times where, again, what's the potential? What's the possibilities? Mm-hmm. And that's... I guess for me, as a priest, is to sort of step back and say, well, we don't understand the big picture. And right mm-hmm. now, it looks bleak. Right. Or right now, it looks like, you know, we, you know, got the tiger by the tail. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. this is, everything's awesome. Yeah. And we're, you know, the church is on a run. The Sunday school's full. Right. This is, you know, times are good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's the ebb and flow of it. And, absolutely. And, and that's, I think that's what you see, too, with religion, that when, when at the best of times and the worst of times, people turn to it. I think I, it certainly sure. right like when you're down and things are terrible you sort of look for answers and when mm-hmm. things are great you uh, or at least some people I, I shouldn't say I, I would everyone say, does I would it, say but suffering more than good times I yeah think in times of suffering you know even I, historically in recent history um, you know churches saw attendance go up after the 9-11 attacks right 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 because so we want again, answers absolutely yeah. like mm-hmm. try to make meaning of this and it's when mm-hmm. we're when that when our um, mortality um, when we're faced with the uh, evil things that human beings do against evil, against people, mm. um, why do inof- innocent suffer and something on a large scale like that that happens in culture and society, then more people are looking for those answers and want to know those questions. And that's when they often will turn to the scriptures. And I think um, certainly the New Testament and uh, the stories about Jesus' life where, again, you know, he suffers injustice he's Mm -hmm. you know innocent and you know and and has a a a message of change um and that isn't heard right um by the those in authority you know and yet from the 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 brokenness Mm -hmm. at the end all of his friends betray him yeah and yet some magical event happens in the resurrection that all of a sudden changes their hearts Mm -hmm. and that the group that you know ran with their tails between their leg all of a sudden is willing to die to say jesus christ was raised from the dead mm. right it's, yeah. the, it's my easter sermon yeah. you go. you've had it it's the week after Easter. Yeah. i'm sorry it's right. fresh on the brain yeah. it's right it's right yeah. it's right fresh. while you're eating your leftover chocolate that's, that's what, right exactly that's while what, you eat yeah. your easter bunny yeah you bite it by um, the ear yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh well this has been terrific thank you so much uh and for everyone if you want to follow Rob on Twitter, is it? I, I just have it. I don't know what the handle is though. It's Rebbed Rob. Rebbed Rob, and yeah. and if you're concerned that it's going to be all religion all the time, it's not. There's no, a lot not. of tech and other things. Absolutely, and, I love um, tech. Yeah, all your are you varied interest. So uh, at Rebbed Rob, um, thank you so much for the time today, Rob. You're welcome, Sean. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I, I think we should, we obviously didn't get to everything I wanted to get to, so we'll do this again. Hopefully, at some point. Um, awesome. That'd be so, great, Sean. So if you have any questions for the podcast, historyslam at gmail.com, Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me.
Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.